June 2000. Part 1, Sympathy for the Devil. Henry is an unusual prisoner. He's been given a high security cell and a few special amenities, Jim Boutwell, Sheriff of Williamson County, Texas. On June 30 of 1998, Henry Lee Lucas, arguably the most prolific and certainly one of the most sadistic serial killers in the annals of crime was scheduled for execution by the state of Texas. Given the advocacy of the death penalty by Governor George W. Bush, things clearly weren't looking good for Henry at that time. Bush had not granted clemency to any condemned man in his tenure as governor. In fact, no governor of any state in the entire history of the country has carried out more judicial executions than has Governor George. At last count, the state of Texas had dispatched 130 inmates on Bush's watch. So Texas was definitely not the place to be for a man in Henry's position. And considering the nature of Henry's crimes, it seemed a certainty that nothing would stand in the way of Henry's scheduled execution. There weren't likely to be any high-profile supporters, a la Carla Fay Tucker, though even personal appeals to Bush from the likes of Pat Robertson failed to dissuade the governor from proceeding on schedule with Miss Tucker's execution. Not likely because Henry's crimes were of a particularly brutal nature, involving rape, torture, mutilation, dismemberment, necrophilia, cannibalism, and pedophilia with the number of victims running as high as 300-600 by some accounts, including Henry's own, at times, though this figure is likely inflated. By all accounts though, Lucas, frequently working with partner Otis Tool, a self-described arsonist and cannibal, savagely murdered literally scores of victims of all ages, races, and genders. All indications were then that this was pretty much of a no-brainer for America's premier hanging governor. But then a most remarkable thing happened. On June 18, just 12 days before Henry's scheduled demise, Governor Bush asked the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, whose members are appointed by Bush himself, to review Henry's case. Strangely enough, eight days later the board uncharacteristically recommended that Henry's execution not take place. The very next day, just three days short of Henry's scheduled exit from this world, Lucas became the first, and to date only, recipient of Governor Bush's compassionate conservatism. The official rationale for this act of mercy was, apparently, that the evidence on which Lucas was sentenced did not support his conviction. There was a possibility that Henry was in fact innocent of the crime for which he was convicted. Never mind that many of the 130 death row inmates who did not get special gubernatorial attention prior to their executions had credible claims of innocence that were met with by nothing but scorn and mockery. Suddenly little George had developed a keen interest in not executing innocent convicts. Never mind as well that some of those who have been executed despite claims of innocence were, other than the crime for which they were being executed, law-abiding citizens. Whereas Henry was by all accounts a serial rapist, kidnapper, torturer and murderer. And never mind that once Henry was spared, Bush promptly lost this passing interest and began once again rubber stamping every execution order that crossed his desk, including that of a great grandmother in her sixties who was convicted of killing her chronically abusive husband, Betty Lou Beats, in February 2000. And never mind that Bush has made no effort in the two years since Henry's commutation to seek a new trial for Henry on one of the murders for which there is conclusive evidence of Lucas' guilt. Neither has he made any effort to extradite Henry to any of the other states in which Henry is wanted for various murders. It seems to me that the last time I checked, there was no statute of limitations for the crime of murder. Why is law and order George not seeking a new death sentence for Lucas? And why is it that Henry was granted full clemency, rather than a temporary stay during which his case could have been reviewed? This is exactly what Bush has just done in the case of convicted murderer Ricky Nolan McGinn. Tellingly, the proliferation of press reports on the McGinn case, apparently meant to soften Bush's image somewhat have made virtually no reference to the governor's earlier actions on behalf of Lucas. Reporting on the McGinn case has avoided the mention of Lucas in one of two ways, 
by noting that this is the first capital case for which Bush has issued a stay, which is true but deliberately deceptive, or by claiming outright that this is the first death penalty case in which Bush has intervened, which is an outright and absolutely shameless lie. And what if Lucas was in fact falsely convicted and his innocence was so blatantly obvious that the governor had no choice but to commute Henry's sentence? What then does this say about the Texas criminal justice system and the ease with which it sends innocent men to their deaths? Are we to believe that Henry's case was an isolated one and that none of the other men put to death during Bush's reign had equally credible claims of innocence? Clearly, there was something more at work than in the Lucas case than simply a question of guilt. There had to be another reason why Bush would take such extraordinary steps to spare the life of a man who had led a life of such brutality. And this was certainly not the first time that the criminal justice system had shown such extraordinary leniency towards Lucas. The first big break for Henry came around 1970, when he was released early from a sentence he was then serving following his first murder conviction. Sentenced to 2040 years, Henry was released after serving just 10. This occurred just after Henry appeared before the parole board and explained to them that he wasn't ready to return to society and would surely kill again if released. As Henry tells it, the questioning went something like this, Now Mr. Lucas, I must ask you, if we grant you parole, will you kill again? Henry, yes, sir. If you release me now, I will kill again. Nevertheless, the board decided that 10 years was an adequate amount of time to serve for the crime of killing one's mother and then violating the corpse. Fair enough. Within a year, of course, Henry found himself back in prison, this time for attempting to abduct a young girl. Despite his prior record, which began long before killing his mother, Lucas served just four years and was again released early, this time in August of 1975. Shortly thereafter, Henry and his new friend Otis would commit an untold number of lurid murders spanning the next eight years. Henry would finally be arrested in October of 1982 on suspicion of two murders, only to be promptly released. He was not arrested again until June of 1983, and has been imprisoned ever since. After his final arrest, Henry was taken on tour, so to speak, by various law enforcement officials around the country during which time he confessed to some 600 murders in 26 states. There were various charges made at the time that Henry was being used by his escorts to clear troublesome unsolved murders in places he had never even been. This quite likely was the case. Henry seemed to have a very chummy relationship with his captors, particularly the Texas Rangers, and provided a valuable service for them by taking the rap for an amazing array of murders. This alone, however, does not explain the personal attention given to Henry's case by Governor Bush. For that, we need to look at some of the more infrequently noted details of Henry's life history, many of them provided by Lucas himself. Henry, as it turns out, has some interesting stories to tell. In 1985, just a couple years into his incarceration, he attempted to tell his story in a book written for him by a sympathetic author. The book, titled The Hand of Death, The Henry Lee Lucas Story, tells of Henry's indoctrination into a nationwide satanic cult. Lucas claimed that he was trained by the cult in a mobile paramilitary camp in the Florida Everglades in the fine art of killing, up close and personal. Other training involved abduction and arson techniques. He further claimed that leaders of the camp were so impressed with Henry's handling of a knife that he was allowed to serve as an instructor. Following his training, Henry claimed to have served the cult in various ways, including as a contract killer and as an abductor of children, who were then taken just over the border to a ranch in Mexico near Juarez. Henry has said that this cult operated out of Texas and from a ranch in northern Mexico, trafficking in children and drugs among other nefarious pursuits. In essence, Henry claimed that what appeared to be the random work of a serial killer was in fact a planned series of crimes often committed for specific purposes. Some of the murders were political hits, according to Henry, including the occasional assassination of foreign dignitaries, 
This was not true for all of Henry's crimes. Some he did just because that's what he liked to do. And it was the one thing that he was really good at. The beauty of this arrangement was that it allowed Henry to conceal the true motive for many of his crimes. Those performed as contract hits looked like all of Henry's murders, senseless and random acts of violence. In Henry's version of events, it was Toole who was responsible for Henry's recruitment and training by the cult and many of the pair's exploits thereafter. Interestingly, in all the standard biographies of the pair, Toole is said to have been Henry's severely retarded junior partner. It is quite clear from reading an interview granted by Toole to a journalist, of sorts, that he was not by any means retarded. Uneducated, no doubt, but definitely not severely retarded. Tool was in fact able to express himself quite clearly, though perversely, and displayed a substantial level of knowledge about the practices of Satanism. In fact, Tool, prior to his death in 1996 was able to give detailed accounts of he and Henry's activities that largely corroborated Henry's stories about the cult. But beyond the stories told by these two credibility-challenged witness, participants, is there any reason to believe Henry's bizarre tale of being a contract killer? And what of Henry's other stories, including the one about being a close friend of Jim Jones of the People's Temple? Henry has claimed on numerous occasions that it was he who personally delivered the cyanide to Jones that was used in the infamous Jonestown Massacre. What are we to make of such stories? Could Henry have been telling the truth about being a contract killer? And if so, did the contracts he was receiving have some kind of government connection? Though Henry never broaches the subject in his book, the training camp as he describes it clearly had military connections. And Henry has explicitly stated that the cult included among its members various prominent persons, including high-level politicians. Could this be the reason for the actions taken by Governor Bush in June of 1998? They think I'm stupid. But before this is all over everyone will know who's really stupid. And we'll see who the real criminals are. Henry Lee Lucas A U.S. Navy psychologist, who claims that the Office of Naval Intelligence had taken convicted murderers from military prisons, used behavior modification techniques on them, and then relocated them in American embassies throughout the world. The Navy psychologist was Lt. Commander Thomas Narrett of the U.S. Regional Medical Center in Naples, Italy. The information was divulged at an Oslo NATO conference of 120 psychologists from the 11-Nation Alliance, the Navy provided all the funding necessary, according to Narrett. Dr. Narrett, in a question-and-answer session with reporters from many nations, revealed how the Navy was secretly programming large numbers of assassins. He said that the men he had worked with for the Navy were being prepared for commando-type operations, as well as covert operations in U.S. embassies worldwide. He described the men who went through his program as hitmen and assassins who could kill on command. Careful screening of the subjects was accomplished by Navy psychologists through the military records, and many were convicted murderers serving military prison sentences. Harry V. Martin and David Call Mind Control, Napa Valley Sentinel, August to November 1991 Anyone familiar with the intelligence community's long-standing obsession with the concept of mind control will immediately recognize what Dr. Narrett was describing as an MKUltra project. The existence of this particular manifestation of the project was first reported by British journalist Peter Watson of the Sunday Times, who attended the conference and interviewed Dr. Narrett. Narrett told him that they looked for candidates who had shown a proclivity for violence. This was at a time when numerous pseudo-investigations of the intelligence community were underway, including the Rockefeller, Pike, and Church committees. Narrett told Watson that he was revealing this highly classified information only because he assumed it was about to surface anyway. Of course, Narrett was mistaken about the interest of the various committees in divulging anything even remotely resembling the truth. Narrett promptly disappeared from public view reappearing only briefly to lamely attempt to retract his prior statements. But it was a little too late. Watson went on to expand upon this initial research to produce a book, War on the Mind, 
one of the better books from the late 1970s on the subject of mind control research by the intelligence community. Walter Bauer referenced Watson's work as well, in his nearly impossible to find Operation Mind Control. So this cat, once let out of the bag, proved rather difficult to stuff back inside. The intelligence community, it seemed, was recruiting from prisons to make use of the natural talents of convicted killers to produce the fabled Manchurian candidates, mind-controlled assassins. This operation involved killers drawn from military prisons, though there is no reason not to suspect that parallel programs were being conducted in civilian prisons as well. Prisons have, after all, provided fertile ground for any number of MKUltra sub-projects for decades. As the Napa Valley Sentinel article noted, mind control experiments, permeate mental institutions and prisons. This was particularly true in the 1960s and 1970s. The NATO conference at which Dr. Narat dropped his bombshell was held in July of 1975. Strangely enough, the very next month Henry would be released to begin his eight-year reign of terror. Clearly of relevance here is the fact that Lucas, during his prior ten-year prison stay, spent four and a half of those years in a mental ward. During this time, he received intensive drug and electroshock treatments. He would later describe this period of incarceration as a nightmare that would not end. Also during this time, he complained chronically about hearing voices in his head taunting him day and night, ostensibly the reason for his confinement in the mental ward, though it could well have been the result of his confinement and treatment. Henry would later spend additional time in an institution in 1980, in the midst of his killing spree. Was Henry recruited and programmed while in prison to be used later by the so-called Hand of Death cult? The possibility clearly is there. He certainly had shown a voracious appetite for violence enough so to make him a very attractive candidate. Indeed, Henry is just the kind of man to be considered a valuable asset by the intelligence community. For anyone who doubts that the CIA, or any other of the numerous interwoven intelligence agencies, would recruit such a man, it is important to remember that we are talking about the same agencies that recruited some of the most bloodthirsty butchers of the Third Reich, men such as Klaus Barbie, Joseph Mengele, Adolf Eichmann, Otto Skorzeny, and Reinhard Jelen. Henry's depravity pales in the shadows of men such as these. Henry probably couldn't even hold his own against some of the organized crime figures, such as Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky and Santos Traficant who were likewise recruited by the CIA. Or against the numerous thugs that the spooks have propped up as dictators around the world, men such as Somoza, Pinochet, Duvalier and Pahula V, to name just a few. In the company of men such as these, Henry would be just one of the boys. No less valuable an asset than, say, Dan Mitrion, the CIA torture aficionado who was a boyhood friend of Jim Jones. This man, known for having homeless persons kidnapped for the purpose of giving torture demonstrations to South American security forces in his soundproof underground chamber of horrors, was hailed as a hero and martyr when he himself was tortured and killed. Hell, Frank Sinatra and Jerry Lewis flew into his hometown and performed a benefit show to raise money for the widow of this great American. So in the world of spooks, Henry would be in good company. As would his partner, Otis Toole, who wouldn't even have the distinction of being the only cannibal recruited by the CIA. As Douglas Valentine writes in the Phoenix program, Morrow, 1990, concerning the CIA's assassination, torture and terror program waged against the people of Vietnam, the Phoenix teams consisted of SEALs working with CTs, described by one participant as a combination of ARV and deserters, VC turncoats, and bad motherfucker criminals the South Vietnamese couldn't deal with in prison, so they turned them over to us. The spooks were only too happy to employ the services of these men who taught, their, SEAL comrades the secrets of the Psy War campaign. So depraved were these agency recruits that some of them would actually devour their enemies' vital organs. All in a day's work for America's premier intelligence agency.
also included in the CIA Rogues Gallery of Distinguished Alumni, according to a number of researchers, is Lucas' self-described close friend, the notorious Jim Jones. What then are we to make of Henry's professed connection to the tragic People's Temple? It has been documented by numerous investigators that the Jonestown massacre was not by any means a case of mass suicide, as was reported by the U.S. press. It was in fact a case of mass murder. The Guyanese coroner, Dr. C. Leslie Matu, concluded that only three of the 913 victims at Jonestown died by means of suicide on that fateful day. All of the rest were executed, some by lethal injection, some by strangulation, and some simply shot through the head. It is apparent then that if Lucas was in fact at Jonestown at the time of the mass murder, he was quite likely doing considerably more than just serving as a delivery boy. A man of Henry's talents would been an invaluable asset in a cleanup operation of this type. And what was being cleaned up was, of course, yet another MK Ultra project, complete with vast stockpiles of drugs, sensory deprivation equipment, and a band of zombie-like assassins who gunned down Congressman Leo Ryan's entourage just prior to the massacre, thus necessitating the cleanup operation. Strange that Henry would claim a connection to a man whose operation was notable primarily for being a breeding ground for mind control and mass murder. Of course Henry, being uneducated and illiterate, would not likely have had access to this information. Even if Henry was literate, he would not have known the story that Maury Terry was to later tell in his book, The Ultimate Evil. Told therein is a tale that chillingly parallels that of Henry and Otis. What Terry revealed was that the murders attributed to the son of Sam, the Manson family, and numerous other interconnected killings, including possibly the Zodiac murders, were not what they appeared to be. While these killings appeared to be the random work of serial, mass murderers, they actually were contract hits carried out for specific purposes by an interlocking network of satanic cults. This book has, by the way, recently been reprinted by Barnes & Noble, go figure, and is highly recommended to anyone who questions the plausibility of Henry's story. In other words, these were professional hits orchestrated and disguised to look like the work of yet another lone nut serial killer. Which is, of course, exactly what Henry claimed his crimes to be, several years before investigative journalist Terry published his convincingly documented work. Lucas' story then, as bizarre as it may appear to be, is certainly not without precedent. Other events that have transpired since Henry first began telling his tales of the Hand of Death lend further credence to various aspects of his story. For example, there is the issue of the cult-run ranch just south of the border. While this may have sounded rather far-fetched back in the early 1980s, it certainly doesn't today. In 1990, just such a ranch was excavated in Matamoros, Mexico, yielding the remains of over a dozen ritual sacrifice victims. While Otis Toole, still alive at the time, noted that this was not the specific ranch with which he and Henry were associated, he also mentioned that there were numerous such operations in the area. So closely did the Matamoros case parallel the stories told years before by Lucas that some law enforcement personnel in Texas chose to take a closer look at Henry's professed cult connections. In fact, Jim Boutwell, sheriff of Williamson County, Texas later told a reporter that investigators had verified that Lucas was indeed involved in cult activities. And a decade later, yet another excavation was begun, this time at a ranch near Juarez. Mexico, which is precisely where Henry claimed it to be. This story made a brief appearance in the American press in December of 1999, until U.S. officials moved in to take over the investigation, after which coverage promptly ceased. Of course, it could just have been lucky guesses by Henry about the Cultron ranches and the networks of satanic cults running murder for higher operations. And it could just be a coincidence that tool who was convicted in the state of Florida, shared with Henry the fate of having his death sentence commuted. Florida is, of course, a state that is also overly zealous in its application of the death penalty. Not zealous enough to execute the likes of Otis Toole, however. In any event, 
It's interesting that both of these men had their death sentences set aside in states run by a member of the Bush family. It's interesting also to take note of the case of the man known as the railroad killer, Rafael Reisandez Ramirez. On July 13, 1999, Ramirez was reported to have walked across a bridge from, where else? Juarez, Mexico went to El Paso, Texas and turned himself in. At the time he was wanted for a string of alleged serial killings. Mirroring the circumstances surrounding Henry's final arrest, Ramirez had been taken into custody several weeks prior by the U.S. Border Patrol, only to be promptly released despite his presence on FBI most wanted lists and the issuing of alerts to the Immigration Service, and with a nationwide manhunt underway. Between this detainment and his surrender, four more victims would be felled by Ramirez, who was, strangely enough, born in Matamoros and raised outside of the home by non-family members, according to his mother. Apparently he still had a little work left to complete. Having done so, Ramirez then made the incomprehensible decision to surrender to Texas authorities. Crossing the border into Texas, Ramirez left a country with no death penalty and entered the execution capital of the Western world. The Los Angeles Times, in reporting on his surrender, noted that he was adamant he wanted to surrender to a Texas Ranger, and that he had not requested an attorney and was cooperating with detectives. In the same article, it is noted that authorities say Ramirez is strikingly intelligent. Strikingly intelligent? not based on his actions taken on July 13 of last year. But then again, perhaps Ramirez knows something about the Texas criminal justice system that the rest of us do not. Otis Tool, I've been meaning to ask you, that time when I cooked some of these people? Why'd I do that? Henry Lee Lucas, I think it was just the hands doing it. I know a lot of things we done, in human sight, are impossible to believe. Otis Tool. When we took him out and cut him up, remember one time I said I wanted me some ribs. Did that make me a cannibal? Henry Lee Lucas, you wasn't a cannibal. It's the force of the devil, something forced on us that we can't change. There's no reason denying what we become. We know what we are. Part 2, The Myth of the Serial Killer July 2000 At some time I have started to hear funny voices like a person calling me, but no one call me. Rafael Reisandez Ramirez, in a letter to a reporter in Houston following his surrender to authorities. Most Americans are familiar with what is considered the classic serial killer profile. This was a notion first put forth by the venerable FBI, which coined the term serial killer and pioneered the concept of profiling, in an alleged attempt to understand the phenomenon of mass murder. In truth, as we shall see, the concept of a serial killer profile was put forth largely to disinform the public. In the case of Henry Lee Lucas, few if any of the elements of the serial killer profile apply. For instance, serial killers are said to act alone, driven to do so only by their own private demons. So far removed from ordinary human behavior are their actions that they would not, indeed could not, share their private passions with others. In Henry's case, this is a patently false notion. It has been officially acknowledged that Lucas worked with at least one, and at times as many as three accomplices, Tool's preteen niece and nephew were frequently brought along to witness, and at times participate in, the crimes of Henry and Otis. It is also claimed that serial killers target a particular type of victim, similar in age, gender, race, and other demographic factors. Again, in Henry's case, this simply does not fit the known facts. Henry's victims in fact had little, if anything, in common physically with one another. The victims' ages ranged from children to the elderly. Both genders and all races were also well represented. It is further claimed that serial killers follow a readily identifiable mo with the means of obtaining victims and the trajectory of the crime following a well-defined pattern. And again, this is clearly not the case with Lucas. Victims were obtained and death inflicted by a variety of means, including bludgeoning, stabbing, strangulation, shooting, and suffocation.
Some were killed in their homes, while others were abducted and taken to remote locations. Some were sexually abused, both before and after death, while others were not. Some were cannibalized. Some were left on display, for maximum impact upon their discovery, while others were left so as not to be discovered at all. In other ways as well, Henry Lee, the consummate serial killer, did not even come close to matching the profile of what he was supposed to be. Strangely though, perhaps the most remarkable aspect of the Henry Lee Lucas story is that it is not actually remarkable at all. In reviewing the case histories of some two dozen other alleged serial killers, it becomes readily apparent that few, if any, fit the supposed profile. The victims of Ray Sandez Ramirez, for instance, ranged in age from 21 to 88 years, with a mix of males and females. The cause of death varied as well, with most being bludgeoned, though one was shot in the head, another stabbed, and yet another had a pickaxe buried in her head. Though not readily apparent, all of these weapons used for inflicting death, by both Lucas and Ramirez, had one thing in common, they are what are termed weapons of opportunity. In other words, they are weapons that were acquired at the crime scene immediately before the murders were committed. Notably, this precisely mirrors the means by which the CIA has historically taught its assassins to kill. A CIA training manual entitled A Study of Assassination advises the would-be killer that the simplest local tools are often the most efficient means of assassination. A hammer, axe, wrench, screwdriver, fire poker, kitchen knife, lamp stand, or anything hard, heavy and handy will suffice. All such improvised weapons have the important advantage of availability and apparent innocence. The assassin may accidentally be searched before the act and should not carry an incriminating device if any sort of lethal weapon can be improvised at or near the site. The Mafia Assassination Service known as Murder Incorporated, the brainchild of the Lansky, Luciano Syndicate, which had extensive connections to U.S. intelligence agencies, had a similar philosophy. As J. Robert Nash notes in Blood Litters and Bad Men, like most of Murder Incorporated's assassins, Pittsburgh Phil never carried a weapon in case the local police picked him up on suspicion. He would cast about, once he had selected his murder spot, for any tool handy that would do the job. As a brief aside, it should be noted that the man identified above as Pittsburgh Phil, whose real name was Harry Strauss, was credited with killing at least 500 people in this manner from the late 1920s through 1940. This feat should put him at or near the top of any self-respecting serial killer list. Henry Lee recounts in The Hand of Death that his training by the cult followed this time-honored tradition. Of course, the venerable FBI assures us that satanic cults and satanic crime do not exist in modern-day America. To put this in its proper context, However, it is important to remember that this is the very same FBI that during the reign of murder incorporated, and for several decades thereafter, refused to acknowledge the existence of organized crime in America. It is also the same FBI that for years ignored the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan, it should be noted, began as an occult-based group formed just after the close of the Civil War by an alliance of Confederate generals and intelligence operatives. The cult's original charter was drafted by General Albert Pike, who had served as the chief of Confederate intelligence. The point of this digression is that the intelligence community has a long history of spawning occult-based groups dedicated to terrorizing society. A number of America's other notable serial killers showed a proclivity for utilizing weapons of opportunity as well. The other serial killing Ramirez, Los Angeles famed Night Stalker, is a case in point. In the majority of the murders attributed to that Ramirez, the victims, who ranged in age from 6 to 84 and were of various races and genders, were stabbed, bludgeoned, slashed, strangled or electrocuted with weapons acquired at the crime scene. And strangely enough, some were intentionally left alive, as was the case with Ray Sandez Ramirez as well. Florida serial killer Bobby Joe Long also showed a preference for inflicting death by a variety of means, shooting, strangling, stabbing, 
often with weapons of opportunity, and also left some of his victims alive. So too did Ted Bundy, whose most notorious alleged crime, the bludgeoning of four women in the Chiomega sorority house, was committed with a club acquired on the grounds of the house immediately before his entry. This crime, by the way, was in marked contrast to Bundy's previous alleged murders, which involved but a single victim. Bundy's final murder before his incarceration, the killing of a 12-year-old girl, also did not match his supposed mo as put forth by FBI profilers. As previously stated, this is the rule rather than the exception. Arthur Shawcross, dubbed the Genesee River Killer, also showed no consistency in the targeting of victims. Males and females, young and old, black and white, all were represented on the victim's list of Shawcross. And this pattern, or non-pattern, is evident in the tales of numerous other serial killers. Charles N.G. and Leonard Lake, authorities recovered the remains of seven men, three women, and two babies from their Northern California compound. The causes of death were impossible to determine. Jeffrey Dahmer, his victims, while all young men, included whites, blacks, Asians, Hispanics, and American Indians. The Hillside Stranglers, Angelo Buono and Kenneth Bianchi, all victims were women, but the cause of death varied, including electrocution, strangulation, lethal injections, and lethal gas, all methods that have been used, strangely enough, to perform judicial executions. Richard Speck, his eight alleged victims died by a variety of means, including strangulation, stabbing, slashing of the throat and breaking of the neck, all in a single evening. The Gainesville Ripper, Danny Rowling, his victims included both men and women from various age groups. The Boston Strangler, Albert DeSalvo, his victims represented a range of ages, races and attractiveness. Though most were strangled, either with materials acquired at the crime scene or manually, some were stabbed, mutilated and or sexually molested as well. Most were left on display, though one was discreetly covered with a blanket. The Vampire of Sacramento, Richard Chase, his victims' ages ranged from 20 months to 51 years, both males and females. Causes of death included shootings, stabbings and bludgeonings, with some victims left mutilated, beheaded and or disemboweled. Some were cannibalized as well. The co-ed killer, Edmund Kemper, all victims were female, though of various ages and races. Death was inflicted by means of stabbing, strangulation, suffocation, shooting and bludgeoning. Herbert Mullen, his victims, both male and female, varied in age from children to the middle-aged. Weapons of choice included guns, knives and blunt instruments. The Manson family, victims, again both males and females, ranged in age from teenaged Stephen Parent to middle-aged Linola Bianca. Death came by way of shootings, stabbings and bludgeonings, or a combination of these. Clearly then there are any number of serial killer cases in which there is no defining modus operandi, and in which the deceased don't fit any kind of victim profile. But what of the notion of the serial killer as a lone predator? Was Henry and Otis' partnership an aberration? Not at all. There are any number of serial killer cases where it is officially acknowledged that there was more than one perpetrator. The Manson family, of course, is probably the most well-known case of multiple perpetrator serial killing. Less well-known is the case of the Ripper crew in Chicago in the early 1980s. Described by authorities as a foreman satanic cult, the Rippers, led by charismatic Robin Jecht, killed as many as 17 women in as many months. There could well have been more than four members of this particular murderous cult, however. A few days after the four were arrested, another ritually mutilated body showed up at a location where previous bodies had been left by the Rippers. Then there is the case of Charles N.G. Though N.G. was the only one to stand trial for his series of killings, it is acknowledged that the crimes were committed with the assistance of Leonard Lake, who committed suicide upon his arrest and evidence strongly suggests that there were others involved as well. Lake's ex-wife was almost certainly involved, 
police were well aware that at the very least, she had tampered with, and removed evidence from, the crime scene, including 12 videotapes believed to be snuff films of the murders, and a diary seized by police with a detailed plan to construct a series of bunkers outfitted with supplies, weapons, and sex slaves strongly hinted that there was more than just two individuals involved. Many other serial killers have worked in pairs as well, such as the Hillside Strangler team of Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Buono. Working the same Los Angeles area turf just one year after the Stranglers were stopped was the team of Roy Norris and Lawrence Pliers Bicker. And a few years after they were caught, the team of Douglas Clark and Carol Bundy would be working the very same LA streets in a series of killings dubbed the Sunset Strip Murders. The year after they were caught, another serial killer took over the LA market, Richard Ramirez, the notorious Night Stalker. According to numerous witnesses, who placed Ramirez back in his home state of Texas at the time of some of the killings, these murders were not the work of a single killer either. Other evidence as well, such as the fact that more than one gun was used in the killings, tends to point to multiple perpetrators. Then there is the matter of the Son of Sam killings in New York. Though most of the literature available paints Berkowitz as the proverbial lone serial killer, Maury Terry and others have presented a compelling case that the killings were in fact the work of multiple cult members. In other serial killer cases as well, evidence pointing to multiple assailants is ignored or explained away with unlikely scenarios. The body of one of Bobby Joe Long's victims, for instance, yielded semen showing both A and B blood types, indicating at least two perpetrators. A later victim also yielded semen evidence which did not match that obtained from the previous victim. And none of the samples proved to match the samples taken from their alleged killer. There has long been speculation that the work of the Boston Strangler, officially deemed to be Albert DeSalvo, was not the work of one man. Most of the officials involved in the investigation, in fact, never believed that a single killer was responsible. Of the eight members of the psychiatric panel convened to develop a profile, seven believed that there were at least two perpetrators. Even in those cases that seemed to come closest to matching the classic serial killer profile, such as John Wayne Gacy and Jeffrey Dahmer, there is a compelling case to be made that there were others involved. That evidence will be examined in the next installment of this series. Here we will examine the cases of two high-profile alleged serial killers, mass murderers who were said to be acting alone. The first is a very recent case, that of Yosemite killer Carrie Stainer. The other dates all the way back to 1966, the year Richard Speck allegedly went berserk in a home filled with young nursing students in Chicago, becoming the first mass murderer of the television age. It's more of a shadow than anything else. You know it's a human being, but yet you can't accept it. The kill in itself, it's like say, you're walking down the road. Half of me will go this way and the other half goes that way. The right hand side didn't know what the left hand side was going to do. Henry Lee Lucas, describing how he perceived his victims prior to killing them. In February of 1999, a 43-year-old woman and two teenage girls, one her daughter, were brutally murdered while visiting Yosemite National Park in California. Police originally suspected a group of men and women with extensive criminal records who were known members of a drug trafficking ring. At least 11 members of this group were at one time suspected of complicity in the women's deaths. The group was based in Modesto, where one of the victims Bill Folds incongruously showed up some time after the murders. One member of the group worked at the hotel restaurant from where the women disappeared. Another had in her possession the victim's bank account number and ATM password. Yet another made incriminating statements to police and was discovered to have blanket fluff in his vehicle that matched the fibers recovered from one of the victims. Investigators were building a substantial case against the group, who were being held in custody on unrelated charges, when a fourth victim was discovered in Yosemite. Two days later it was declared that a handyman at the hotel taken into custody, Carrie Stainer, was solely responsible for all four murders. Unexplained, then or now, 
was the evidence that earlier had pointed in the direction of others. Many of those involved in the case harbor serious doubts that Stainer acting alone could have committed these crimes. Apart from the physical evidence and testimony implicating others, the story concocted to explain how these murders were the work of a single individual is questionable at best. A good number of police and FBI agents assigned to the case believed from the beginning that more than one perpetrator was responsible, based on the physical implausibility of a single assailant. Many doubt that one man acting alone could have gotten the jump, so to speak, on three able-bodied women and bound them all. They also doubt that one man could have carried the three bodies out to his car undetected, with one still alive and most likely resisting the killer's efforts, aware that her friend and mother had both already been killed. According to the official story though, that is exactly what happened. Stainer then allegedly single-handedly cleaned up the hotel room in which the first two murders occurred before driving for miles to kill the third victim and dump the body. The killer then supposedly drove many more miles to another location to abandon the car, with the other two bodies still in the trunk. Stainer is next said to have taken a cab back to Yosemite Valley, though he would most likely have been covered in blood at the time. Two days later, he is said to have returned to the car in yet another vehicle and at that time to have set it afire, still with the two bodies inside. After this, he allegedly drove to Modesto to dump the billfold, though why he didn't destroy it in the car fire along with the rest of the evidence is anyone's guess. Even with this rather convoluted story, authorities have not been able to explain away all of the incongruous evidence. For example, a taunting letter sent by the killer revealing the location of one of the bodies was sealed with saliva that was not that of Stainer. The FBI reluctantly acknowledged that DNA tests had verified that fact. Spokesmen for the Bureau had an explanation, however, their theory was that Stainer had tricked an unsuspecting male into supplying the saliva to seal the envelope. How exactly this would be done was left to the imagination. As was why it would be done. If Stainer had the foresight to not want to leave incriminating evidence on the letter and envelope, why not just use ordinary old tap water? It's been known to do the job. If the available evidence in the Stainer case leaves doubts about the sole guilt of the accused, this is all the more true in the case of the infamous Richard Speck. The official story of what happened to those eight student nurses in the early morning hours of July 14, 1966 is, in a word, preposterous. If veteran criminal investigators are puzzled as to how Stainer was able to subdue three women, then it boggles the imagination how one man was able to single-handedly subdue nine women, bind them all, and then systematically kill all but one of them. According to the sole survivor, Cora Amorau, it was she who answered the door that night, allowing Speck entry into the home. She claimed he was brandishing a gun, though none of the victims were shot that night and no evidence was ever found indicating that a gun was used at the crime scene. It was claimed that Speck stole the gun from a rape victim on the very day of the slaughter, after which it promptly disappeared. Speck quickly corralled Damorau and the five other women in the house into a room where he proceeded to tear up a sheet into strips and tie the women up, one by one. How he was able to accomplish this while keeping all the rest at bay is anyone's guess. Three more women would arrive home that evening and would likewise be subdued and bound by Speck. Meanwhile, Speck began dragging the women off one at a time and slaughtering them, taking 20 minutes or more with each victim. As he finished with each, according to Amorau, he would wash up and then return for another. This scene played itself out over the course of at least three hours. During this time, the women awaiting their turn tried to hide under the beds, hoping to elude their assailant. They were, of course, found and killed. All, that is, except Cora Amorau who claims she avoided detection by Speck. The suggestion was made that Speck had lost count of his victims and had falsely concluded that all the girls were dead thereby making the crucial error of leaving a living witness. This part of the story is problematic in a number of ways. The first question raised is why did the girls remain in the room in which they were bound? 
if, despite their bindings, they were able to move about within the room, which they clearly were or they would not have been able to get under the beds, then why not leave the room altogether? And once out of the room, why not get completely out of the house? And what was to prevent the women from untying each other? After all, the pattern was set early on. After the first couple of slayings, it had to be abundantly clear to the women that their lives were about to come to an abrupt end. It also had to be quite clear that there would be 20 minutes to kill, no pun intended, before the killer returned, more than enough time to attempt an escape. And what was there to lose? It is inconceivable that these women would have remained to await their turn with Speck. And what of the survivor? It should be readily apparent to anyone that an adult human simply cannot successfully hide underneath a bed. This is amply illustrated by the